we're, we're going to talk about another topic first, which is we need to talk a little bit about Ukraine, okay? Um, I know uh, we talked about this a lot before I was sick. Um, let's talk about what's going on in Ukraine. Some of you may recall, if you watched, which you probably did, um, if you watched my last coverage, I tried, I was warning people um, that unfortunately things are going to get really bad in Ukraine really fast and really soon. Um, and the reason why I said that, I laid out the, um, I laid out my case for that, which is that there is no way that Russia is going to back down here. The fact that they committed to a land invasion um, of Ukraine means that they're not going to surrender. They're not going to back down. And what that inevitably means is that as things don't go quickly for them, because the Ukrainian people are not going to lay down and die, obviously, as things start to slow down for the Russians, it was going. it's going to get very, very violent. And unfortunately... That is exactly what has happened. Um, as of a, as of yesterday, um, I have been following the perpetual shelling of the town of Mariupol. Some of you may recall that in the first Ukraine streams, uh, I had a camera up overlooking Mariupol, and I regret, uh, I regret to inform you that uh, I regret to inform you that Mariupol. 80% of Mariupol has been destroyed by missiles. Eighty percent of that city that we were looking at just a week and a half ago is gone. Forty percent of it cannot be rebuilt ever. It's just done. And that is an incredibly hard thing to grapple with. And I also want to point out that this, that all of those statistics, the fact that the town is fucking destroyed, also should be taken in the context of Russia deliberately interrupting humanitarian corridors. So what that means is that uh, Russia said, okay guys, open up the, the, make it so that the citizens can flee, and then they blew up those escape lines and said, actually, you can only flee to Russia. You're not allowed to flee west. You can flee to Russia or you can flee to another city. And when you get there, you will be put on tribunal. That is what is currently going on in Mariupol. You can't leave unless you flee to Russia where you will be judged for whether you betrayed Russia or not or betrayed the, the 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 independent republic that Russia declared that is so fucking bad that is such a horrible situation that it's hard for me to even communicate it to you i want you to imagine that you are trapped in a city and that every time you try to leave either the railway gets exploded and you can't leave or you're told okay come on this is going this train is going to russia get in the people who are invading you you're going into their country now and your other option is to sit still while you watch every other building in town get blown up getting closer and closer to your building and your choice is go to russia the country of the people invading you find a black market way to escape, which could get you in trouble with the Ukrainian law, which could get you in trouble with other law, you know, aka you become a refugee and you flee through illegal means, or you blow up. Can you imagine being in that situation? I can't. I can only loosely imagine it. And it is so bad. The situation in Ukraine is so motherfucking bad. And unfortunately, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but it's going to get worse. Russia is not backing down. They can't. Russia destroyed their economy. They have to conquer or they will lose. If they don't gain land, they destroyed their economy for nothing. 
So Russia will continue to kill. And as they get more desperate, it's going to get more brutal. They have to. It is the only logical path forward. This is why we're anti-war. This is why, while even those of us who are not pacifists, even those of us who believe in, conf in that we sometimes have to take up arms, we are anti-war because war between nation states is so heinous and so disgusting and so pointless and so destructive that it, is an, it should be considered an offense to all of mankind. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that that sounds a bit like an emotional appeal because it is. Infernatrix Sophia says, they demanded Mariupol surrender two days ago, but the Mariupol forces can't do that because in 2014, Russia made a similar demand, negotiated a surrender of a city for the Ukrainian troops to leave, and then they violated the agreement to kill as many of them as possible. It's called the Battle of Yo uh, Yoviask. L L Yoviask. Yoviask. Uh, I, would, I will need to read on that. The Battle of Iloviask. Wait, let's take a look at this. Here, let's read this real quick. The Battle of, of Iloviask started on, 7, on 7th of August 2014 when armed forces of Ukraine and pro-Ukrainian paramilitaries began a series of attempts to capture the city of Iloviask from pro-Russian insurgents affiliated with the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and uh, detachments of the Russian armed forces. Although Ukrainian forces were able to enter the city, they were encircled between the 24th and 26th of August by overwhelming Russian forces that crossed the border. After days of encirclement, U Ukrainian commander Yurizy Berezia came to an agreement with Russian commanders in Iloviask to allow R Ukrainian troops to withdraw from the city. This agreement was not honored, and many soldiers w died while trying to escape. This is what we call a massacre, by the way. This is called a massacre. When you agree to a surrender, and then you kill the people who surrendered, that's a massacre, and a war crime. But guess what? All of this is war crimes. All of this is. When will Russia ever be held accountable? You can't co you can't hold Russia ac accountable. Did you know that? You can't you you can't hold a nation accountable because nations are constructs. You can only punish the people in charge of that nation and the people who are captured by that nation. And by the way, by the way, when I say captured, I mean that. When you were born in the country that you live in, were you given an option for citizenship or were you made a citizen? You were obviously, that was a you know obvious uh, uh, rhetorical question. You were made a citizen. Everyone is made a citizen of wherever they're fucking born. Because if not, you don't have any rights because we live in a world where states are are abound. The entire world is made up of all kinds of states, competing states, which capture their population, force them to be loyal to the nation in one way or another. Even the most critical uh, people who are critical of the United States, we are all tied up and forced to benefit the nation, even if we don't agree with it, even if we're treated poorly. You can't make a nation accountable, not in a meaningful way. You can punish the citizens. You can perhaps punish the leaders. But that's the problem with nations. They are constructs. They are constructs that people are chained to and that people live and die for, that people are sent into battle with vague notions of national glory to die horrible deaths fighting other generally young people also instilled with vague notions of national glory it's a big problem but what i was trying to say before back before i was sick before i took a break i know a lot of people might not remember it um uh, uh, uh what i was trying to say was that um i warned you all that it was going to get worse and i'm telling you now it's going to get even worse unless ukraine agrees to surrender um and takes the hit takes that loss russia is going to keep increasing the pressure and we need to prepare ourselves for what we might see and for who might get involved 
because the reality is Russia is doing imperial expansionism and we need to be real about that because otherwise we're going to get blindsided. We're going to get blindsided by the violence. We're going to get blindsided by the propaganda. We're going to get blindsided by the by the atrocities. We're going to get blindsided by the refugees. We're going to get blindsided by the economic impact. They're not going to stop. And if they do, it will only be after the Ukrainian people have suffered so greatly that it's hard for us to even conceptualize. Do you think at this point that intervention by other nations directly within the country of Russia is justifiable in any form to stop what's happening? I know nations are going to nation, but I'm wondering what we what it would take to stop the bloodshed by now. That's the problem. I don't think there's anything that can, there's not much that can be done now, right? This is part of the problem with, uh, with, with states. This is part of the problem with centralizing all powers of violence in the hands of a few heads of state. Yes. Does Russia have like a, 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 democracy they on paper they have a democracy we know that there's massive corruption we know that they don't even have like an actual democracy but they do have one on paper but at the end of the day there are a handful of people who control that entire nation who control all of the major decisions yes are we better than when there was one empire emperor yeah i suppose but keep in mind that it's always been the case throughout history that no one person has complete and ultimate power. It only takes a handful of people with ultimate power to make the world a bad place. This is why we fight against the existence of such incredible monopolizations on violence. So I don't know. Harm mitigation is all the ukrainian people should should uh, uh uh the ukrainian people should do their best to stay alive i don't know no there's nothing that anybody can do if there was involvement if there was direct conflict with russia nuclear war would break out russia has been very clear that they're willing to engage in nuclear war calling that bluff could destroy the entire planet you can't call that bluff we can't call that bluff that's the problem that we run into at the end of the day. That is the problem. Saber Flote says, It's times like these that generate the deep dread associated with feeling completely powerless in a system designed to strip all power from the average person within it, Demon Mama. It's the real sense of capitalist malaise. Isn't it? Isn't it? It is hard to deal with. But that is the... That is, why do you think I lean into anarchist philosophy? Why do you think I find anarchist philosophy so interesting? Specifically, left anarchist philosophy. The reason why I care so much about left anarchist philosophy is specifically because it talks about way, building ways that we can engage with one another cooperatively that can, that can, that can uh, undermine our reliance on gigantic, horrifically violent, oppressive mostly controlled by white cis people empires and uh, yeah like it's just there's a reason why and the reason is that guys i don't know if you know this but like the modern nation state is very new and in the period that we've been existing in a world run by modern nation states we have had so much bloodshed that our ancestors couldn't even conceive of it the types of wars that our ancestors fought, as epic as they could ever be, as much as they're written about, none of them even come close to a modern conflict where entire populations are vaporized in the blink of an eye. We live in hell. We live in hell because we gave the ability to make all decisions, all wealth, all resources, all weaponry. We gave it up. To the hands of a of a handful of rich as fuck individuals we aren't that far from monarchy we really aren't it hasn't been that long a lot of things literally some of the royal families still exist and are billionaires to this day we have to push ourselves to come up with better solutions we have to come up with ways to build uh to to build systems that aren't profit based that are based on sustainability on mutual growth and thriving 
on taking care of one another, on doing things for one another that only we have the expertise to do, and other people doing stuff for us that they have the expertise to do. Chemists and, and doctors and uh, craftsmen and artists coming together to live together and not just to ex exploit each other forever because, uh, uh, because of profit. Isn't it weird that like our system builds the conditions that it then condemns people when you bring up things like we should move to a system that's less focused on pro on on profit where we provide things for one another and it is understood that we will be that that our work and our and our time will be spent taking being happy and taking care of one another in a very direct and social connected way as much as possible and people will go you can't have that because everyone is selfish and then you go what makes you say that everyone is selfish and they go well look at capitalism and then you go you mean the system that from the top down demands that you pay for everything no matter what and that you work no matter what uh, for whoever you chance upon Wow, that system makes humans behave greedily? Jeez, it almost seems like your system is the one that's making people behave that way.